Hello everyone and welcome to this time of worship. I'm so glad that you have chosen to set this time aside to worship God, to think about God, to think about how he has led you in the past, to think about how he will lead you in the days ahead, to meditate on his word, to sing, to pray. Worship matters, folks. That's why we continue to offer to you these online times of worship for those of you who are not able to gather with your own church families. Oh, how we pray that you sense the spirit and the presence of the Lord as you enter into this time of worship. As we begin, I want to read from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord, the Lord God Almighty. Let us pray. O Lord, please come to us as we worship you today. Help us to Set aside the distractions. Lord, would you help the thoughts in our minds to to focus in on thoughts about you, your goodness, your grace, your promises. Help us, Lord, to truly enter into this time of worship with you and with our brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world. Lord, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Well, hey friends, do you guys know how to do the hoagie pogey? Well, it kind of goes like this. You put your left hand in, you put your left hand out, you put your left hand in and you shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around and that's what it's all about. And then you do your right hand. So then we we'll put our right hand, you guys are gonna do it with me? Put our right hand in, we put our right hand out, we put our right hand in and we shake it all about. We do the hokey pokey and we turn ourselves around and that's what it's all about. And you keep going, you, your left foot, you do your right foot, you do your head and eventually you put your whole body in and you put your whole body out and that's how you do the hokey pokey. And each part of your body is essential to the, to do the hokey pokey. Your head can't do the hokey pokey by itself because how is it gonna turn itself around? You need your whole body to do the hokey pokey. Each part is essential to the song and to the dance. And that reminds me of what the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says, just as one body, uh, though one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is to Christ. Now, if the foot shall say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason, stop being part of the body. And then it says, if the ear says I'm not an eye, well, we need our ears. We need our eyes, we need our feet, we need our hands, we need our whole body. And so the church is the body of Christ, which means we need everyone as a part of the body because everyone has different gifts and different talents. Everyone has something special that they bring to the body of Christ. Meaning, you know, maybe I'm not good at singing, but somebody else is. Maybe I'm not good at this, but somebody else is. We need our whole body because that's what God calls us to. Every person is important in part of the church. Just like every body part is important to the whole body. Together, we make up what is called the body of Christ. We have special gifts. Maybe you have the gift of being creative, being a great listener, or being a great helper. Or maybe it's something totally different. So I want you guys to think about what is that special gift that God has given you? And how can we use this special gift to serve others? Just as God gave us hands, feet, eyes, and ears to meet the needs of the whole body, he has given different people different gifts to meet the needs of the whole church. So isn't that great that God made us, each one of us, special, and that we're important to God's church, to God's work? in the world. Well, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us special gifts. Help us to remember that each of us is an important body, part of the body of this church, Lord. Help us to use the gifts for the benefit of your kingdom and for others. Pray your blessing over everyone worshiping with us today. Oh Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, well, I'm going to get back to the hokey pokey, and we'll see you next time.
are going to begin today a journey through the Gospel of Mark. I am excited to begin this journey with you as we move into a brand new year, 2022. We are starting with chapter one of Mark's Gospel today, and we will end on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day with Mark 16. I mean, that's the plan right now. The plan is for us to preach through one chapter a week, which is a very ambitious plan due to the copious amounts of amazing stories in this very fast-paced account of the life of Jesus Christ. I encourage you to read a chapter before your time of worship and to read the same chapter after the time of worship to maximize your preparation and the opportunities for you to grow in faith and in hope and in love. Today, to lay the foundation for this new series, I'm going to give some background on the Gospel of Mark, sort of the who, what, when, where questions, and try to give us a solid glimpse into a pretty lengthy uh, introductory chapter. So we definitely need prayer. Let's pray. Lord, your word is a lamp for our feet and a light on our path. Your son, Jesus, brings your word to life. Help us to listen. Help us to learn. Help us to love like Jesus loves. Holy Spirit, draw us in ever closer to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So with confidence in the long-standing work of biblical scholars throughout the ages, we know that Mark's gospel is the earliest gospel written about 30 years after Jesus's resurrection and ascension, which places its writing somewhere between 64 and 68 AD. Mark's gospel then served as one of the main sources for the writers of the gospel of Matthew and Luke. You might wonder then, why then is the gospel of Mark not the first gospel presented in the New Testament? Matthew is the first gospel that is presented. Well, some say that for a long time, it was believed that Matthew's gospel was written first. Now, don't get all bent out of shape, right? The Bible is not out of order. The Bible is never out of order. The Bible is God's word, and it is given and presented to us exactly how God intended it to be given to us. Personally, I think it's beautiful and wonderful and perfect that the New Testament begins with the genealogy that we find in Matthew chapter 1. Now, obviously, the author of the Gospel of Mark is someone named Mark, John Mark, to be exact. Mark was a companion to the Apostle Paul and later came alongside the Apostle Peter in Rome. In fact, it's believed that the Gospel of Mark is primarily Peter's remembrances of his life-transforming years with Jesus. Mark helped Peter to pen down his remembrances, his amazing remembrances. Now, did Mark ever see Jesus himself? Tradition holds that he did, that he was present when Jesus was arrested on the Mount of Olives. We're going to explore that a little more when we get to chapter 14. So let's be really clear. John Mark was not one of the 12 disciples or you could call them apostles of Jesus. He was not. He, we first hear his name in the book of Acts in connection to his mother, who was a widow whose name was Mary. Acts 12, 12 tells us that Peter went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. So John Mark's mom was sometimes the host for the gathering of the early church in Jerusalem. And it is thought by many that it was in her home that Jesus possibly ate the Last Supper with his disciples. 
We know that Mark was instrumental in helping Paul and Barnabas and Peter build and strengthen the early church. It is believed that Mark was martyred for Christ. He was tied to a horse and dragged to his death by a mob of unbelievers on Easter 68 AD. When you read the Gospel of Mark, you get a sense that Jesus wasn't just ADD, he was ADHD. In Mark's account, Jesus goes from one healing moment to another, to an exorcism, to a big preaching event, to an intimate moment with somebody crying out for him. In Mark's gospel, you get the sense that Jesus did not have a lot of downtime, that he was just going, 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 running, 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 which is certainly not the overall ethos of Matthew, Luke, or John. Now, why did Mark write this way? Well, remember, he's writing on behalf of who? Peter. Yeah, Peter. The impetuous, spontaneous, passionate, completely transformed disciple. Peter finally got someone to help him get it all down on papyrus, and he was overflowing with stories and with memories and with life-changing moments. Mark uses action-oriented words like immediately, and then close to 30 times in 16 chapters. He uses and 34 times, making you sometimes feel like you're drinking from a fire hose. And instead of using the present tense in his writing, he uses what is called the historic present. He wants us to experience being there with Jesus, not just reading about him. And one more of the distinctive characteristics of Mark's gospel is his frequent interrupting of one story to insert a second story in the middle, often called a Markin sandwich. So you have one story, and then he interrupts that story with another story, and then he finishes that story over here. So you get it? A Markin sandwich. I remember when Bonnie Cornelius was working in the office with me, we would be talking about one project and the work of another project would interrupt that project's discussion before we could get back to conversation about the first project. And this is when one of us would frequently call out, Squirrel! Speak! Hi there! <gasps> Did that dog just say hi there? Oh yes! Bruh! My name is Doug. I have just met you, and I love you. <laughs> My master made me this collar. He is a good and smart master, and he made me this collar so that I may talk. Squirrel! This is how we feel sometimes when we are reading Mark's gospel. Squirrel! But these interruptions, they have a purpose. Of course they do, because it's the word of God. The story within the story helps us to understand both stories better and most importantly, helps us to come to know and love Jesus better. I hope to point out these Markin sandwiches as we move through the gospel, as we move through this journey together. Now, Mark was writing primarily to Gentiles, non-Jews in Rome at the time of Nero, which is a horrible time for Christians, a time when Christians were persecuted and violently killed as a loud and clear message to other Christians, deny your faith in Jesus or die. Mark wants to encourage them with his words. He wants them to be reminded of Jesus's character as one who speaks and acts and delivers in the midst of of hard times in the midst of crises. Mark's gospel has no genealogy and no story of Jesus's birth. Mark gets right to it by clearly making his purpose known in chapter one, verse one. He begins his work by declaring who Jesus is. And this is the overall purpose of the gospel of Mark, to declare and to prove by historical events and narrative example that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who has authority beyond the authority of any earthly leader. Controversial? You bet. 
Jesus is the one promised to come to save us, we read in Mark's early words. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So let's read now from chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 15. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. John the Baptist, called to be the voice who was crying out in the wilderness, embodied what he preached. He lived a simple life for a single purpose, to prepare the way for the promised Messiah, the Son of God, the one for whom Israel had been waiting for such a long time. He's coming soon, he proclaimed. We have to get ready. We have to clean our lives up. We have to prepare the way for him so that not one of us will be in the way of his mighty work. Can you imagine the moment John looked up and saw Jesus walking through the crowds right towards him in the Jordan River? I mean, personally, John knew who he was. Their mothers were related. They knew each other. But John also knew who Jesus was on a cosmic level, folks. He knew what he knew, and he knew that everything in his life had led up to this very moment. Oh my, he must be thinking, it's really happening. He, It's really happening, he's thinking, as Jesus steps down into the water. Now, there was no need for Jesus to do what the other people were doing in the Jordan River. He didn't need to repent of any sins and then be baptized to show and symbolize the washing of those sins away. No. But he came to be with us. Emmanuel. He came to be with us in every way. Fully God and fully man at the same time. He came to do for us what nobody else could do for us. He came to be with us, to bear our sins, and to provide righteousness on our behalf. He came to make you right with God. He came to make me right with God. Can't do that on our own. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus told John, that he had to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. That's chapter 3, verse 15. He said we have to do this to fulfill all righteousness. 
He had to go through it all, from birth to baptism, from baptism to the cross, from the cross to the grave, and from the grave to life eternal. Jesus joined the fallen race, you and me, for whom he was providing righteousness by sharing our baptism. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11, we hear this, After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ, the suffering servant, the righteous king, came to do. For us. After coming up out of the water, God confirms what Mark has already stated. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. It's like Mark is already asking his readers, any questions? Any questions? And then Mark has Jesus being immediately driven out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. We get two verses on this, two verses on this. Well, obviously Jesus passed that test with Satan because after learning that John the Baptist has been arrested, there's no details here. The next thing we hear are Jesus's first words in the gospel of Mark. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Now, here is the Amplified Bible's interpretation of Jesus' first words. The appointed period of time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking. Regret past sins. Live your life in a way that proves repentance. Seek God's purpose for your life and believe with a deep Abiding trust. Believe in the good news regarding salvation. Repent from our old ways of being and doing and walk into the newness of life that Jesus promises and provides for us. What, what a great message as we begin a new year, right? Repent and believe. Now, why? Because Jesus is the Son of God. He is God himself come to earth to be with us, to defeat the works of the devil in and around us, to heal us body, mind, and spirit, and to save our souls for an eternity of glory in heaven. That's why we want to repent and believe. In Mark's gospel, this fast-paced account of the most extraordinary life ever lived on the planet. When we first meet Jesus, what is he doing? He is walking into a scene of people being made ready for him. Being ready for him by John, the forerunner, the one who came before him to prepare the way in the wilderness. God chose the time. Jesus chose to obey. As a 30-year-old man, he left behind a relatively quiet, private, and predictable life with his family for the public life that God had called him to live. At first, it was best for not too many people to know who he was. He could move about the land more freely then. But the spread of the good news, once it started, once the kingdom of God had come, there was no stopping it. Because good news flows naturally like water to the low places. And we, you, have been given that living water. We are part of the never-ending story of the Son of God. We are part of the history. We baptize with water, yes, but Jesus, 
Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. He is with us now through the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit. And once you submit to his authority in your life, your life is forever changed by him. It is. I mean, I may yet be short-sighted in my thinking, but how much more so would I be if I had not heard and obeyed the call of Christ in my life? Without repentance and belief in him, my heart would be more prone to self-exalting and my eyes would not be open to the needs of others near and across the world as they are today. What authority does Jesus have in your life? What authority does he have in my life? What authority does Jesus have in our lives? What authority have we given to the word of God? Are we quick to compromise? Are we quick to say, oh, you know, that was, that was back in those days. We don't have to pay attention to that now. Are we quick to keep the part that sounds right in our opinion? And are we quick to ignore the parts that we just don't want to hear? What authority? Have we given to Jesus and to the word of God? I guess the question can be boiled down to this one. Who's the boss of your life? Who's the boss of my life? As we travel through the gospel of Mark, may unrepentant hearts come to repentance. May unbelievers come to a transforming belief in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. May the weak be strengthened. May the sick be healed. May we be amazed at his teaching. And may his authority expand in our lives. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen. mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended Took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery. He the perfect son of man. In his living and his suffering. Never trace nor stain of the true and better Adam come to save the help of man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Christ the Lord upon the tree In the stead of ruined sinners Hangs the Lamb in victory See the price of our redemption See the Father's plan unfold Bringing many sons to glory Grace on
for our closing prayer today, I'm going to read a prayer from Jesus Listens. Would you join me now in prayer? Holy Lord, I love to worship you in the beauty of holiness. The beauty of your creation reflects some of who you are, and it delights me. You are working your ways in me. The divine artist creating loveliness in my inner being. You've been clearing out the debris and clutter within me, making room for your spirit to take full possession. Help me to collaborate with you in this effort, being willing to let go of anything you choose to take away. You know exactly what I need, and you have promised to provide all of that abundantly. I don't want my sense of security to rest in my possessions or in things going my way. You are training me to depend on you alone, finding fulfillment in your loving presence. This involves being satisfied with much or with little of the world's goods, accepting either as your will for me instead of grasping and controlling. I'm learning to release and receive, to cultivate this receptive stance. Oh, how I need to trust you more in any and every situation. Oh Lord, I pray for all of us praying together right now that we would submit to your authority in our lives. That we would not be afraid to say, your will, not mine, be done. Trusting that you do know what is best for us and for the people around us. Lord, we want to walk in your way. We don't want to step out ahead. We want to follow you. We want to learn from you, for you are gentle and humble in heart. And you promise that you will give us rest for our souls. In these times in which we live, we certainly need rest for our souls. Help us to remember that we find that in you and only you. All this we pray together in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power forever and ever. Amen. Receive this benediction now from the book of Jude. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ the Lord, be all glory and honor and majesty and all authority before all time and now and forevermore. Thanks be to God. Amen.
There is no one.